Hi, I'm Brittany Johnson. I am the marketing manager and HR manager here at Surf Pro of Orange, Sullivan, and South Ulster counties. We are a full service cleaning and restoration business. So we help people with fire damages, water damages, mold remediation. We also do COVID disinfecting, air duct system cleanings, some general cleanings, and we also have a full construction division. So that division also puts together and puts back all of the sheetrock or flooring that we may take out from a disaster. We help both residential and commercial clients truly make it like it never even happened and get them back into their home or business as quickly and as efficiently as possible. We are a family owned and operated business. So we have been in business for 35 years and my sister and I are running the business now as well as my dad to continue helping customers on a daily basis. We have helped people through the pandemic by giving back to our local first responders. So fire, EMS, police, we were able to go and disinfect over 800 first responder vehicles free of charge. We wanted to give back to them because they were the ones still on the front lines helping people and didn't have a choice to work or not. We were able to be deemed essential from the beginning as well. So we continue to help people throughout the pandemic, keeping people working as well here at our business. If you or anybody you know that may have some sort of disaster or wanna just be more prepared, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help them walk through how we help people during a disaster and be able to make it truly like it never even happened. Hello and good morning everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Scott Perry and along with my business partner, Matt, I own Atlas Security Services. We're a security guard provider. We provide services throughout the Hudson Valley as well as in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Matt's a retired trooper and I'm a retired NYPD sergeant. We've been in business since 1992 and we currently have approximately 200 guards on staff. We provide services to all industries, municipalities, educational, healthcare, retail, entertainment, etc. We have a list of clients that reads like a who's who of Orange County and the Hudson Valley and we're very proud of that fact. We provide the same services that the multinational companies provide. However, we maintain a hands-on approach where myself or my business partner are available 24 seven. In addition to the security services such as armed and unarmed guards that we've been providing for several decades. Recently, due to the new challenges we face, we're providing temperature screening, wellness questioning, the maintaining of social distancing guidelines. So if you or any of your clients have any questions regarding security services, please reach out. Thank you for your time and have a good day. When patients walk through our doors, they are not a number, they are not a disease, they are not a diagnosis, they are a person. Here, I don't feel separated from, you know, these specialists that help me. It's like, we're talking as well, and you know, she's telling me about what's going on with her, which helps me, because I'm like, I'm not the only one going through this. They don't treat you just like you're just a patient. I feel with these people, they're, they're like an extended family to me. They treat you like you're one of theirs. It's really nice that they're not just um, treating physical, they're listening to your emotional issues and just uh, treating you as a whole person. They listen and they talk to you, like you're a person, like you're really existing. <laughs> they appreciate you and they help you, and I appreciate them back. And that's how I feel, they gave me respect, they gave me love, um, they listened to me. Bueno, es que yo siempre estoy refiriendo gente aquí. This is one place here that I would not change. This is my place. Good morning. I'm Heather Bellmeyer, the Acting President and CEO of the Orange County Chamber of Commerce. I'm delighted to welcome you today to our March membership meeting, Meet Our State Legislators. Today, we are hosting State Senators Scoofus and Martucci. James Scoofus and his family moved to the town of Woodbury from Queens in 1995. 
For many of the same reasons that we all choose to live in the area, a better quality of life, an education that strives for nothing short of excellence, and a strong, friendly, and caring community. During his six years in the State Assembly, James fought for the Hudson Valley's working and middle class that are often overlooked by the government. He's been a champion of better schools, strong infrastructure, and leveling the playing field. James was elected to the State Senate in 2018 and re-elected in 2020, where he continues delivering results while serving with integrity, as well as chairing the State Investigations Committee. James lives in Cornwall with his loving wife, Hillary, who he married in 2017. Welcome, Senator Scopus. Thanks very much, Heather. And I'm delighted to join you. I'm delighted to join my colleague, Senator Martucci, who is a friend and partner in the Senate. And if I'm not mistaken, if this is not your first uh, virtual breakfast, um, it's got to be pretty close to it. And so congratulations to you. And um, I wish you the best uh, in the days and weeks and months ahead. Um, and so, look, I've I've joined the chamber here now. I think this is my maybe ninth or tenth uh, legislative breakfast since I've I've been in the state legislature. And uh, this one certainly is uh, quite a bit unique compared to the previous uh, eight or nine. Um, and you know what a time to be doing this. It's you know Albany is quiet as a mouse. Like there's no news to talk about. Uh, and you know here we are. Um, when in fact there's a budget due in two and a half weeks. The governor has all these scandals. And so I think there's lots to talk about and I'm really happy to be here. But um, first I wanna thank your, your membership uh, because over the past year, and I don't need to tell any of you, you know, this has been the most challenging uh, economic time, uh, especially for small businesses, um, probably you know, in a number of generations, maybe in you know, 100 years or so since the last time we've had a pandemic and the entire economy was shut down. And I know just you know, through my office uh, last year, you know, as millions of people were dealing, literally in New York, were dealing with being furloughed and, and unemployment, uh, my office helped over 5,000 people get their unemployment who literally couldn't even get a, a call back from the Department of Labor and were struggling so mightily. And so, you know, I've, I've been out there and I've seen a lot of the carnage. Um, you know, Main Street in Cornwall is literally, you know, a three or four minute walk uh, from my house. And it's, it's been heartbreaking. And yes, uh, you know, especially the federal government has um, over, you know, a couple of different stimulus bills um, provided some PPP and, uh, and other assistance to attempt to keep some folks afloat. Um, but that's sort of, you know, at best, um, and many have not been able to, to stay afloat, sadly. Um, so, so we have a lot of work to do. You know, where there's crisis, however, um, I think there's opportunity to come out of this stronger and better. Uh, and that's what certainly my focus is uh, heading into this state budget uh, negotiation and this legislative session. Um, you know, we, we have a chance, I think, to, to rebuild stronger. There's a lot of rubble out there. Uh, and, you know, let's take the opportunity to get people back to work uh, and put New Yorkers first in this budget over the next few weeks. So that's uh, that is certainly my priority um, in this budget. Uh, look, you know, we we got some good news literally just yesterday uh, from Washington. Uh, you know, we were staring down a pretty significant deficit as a result of covid. Look, when businesses are closed, there's no sales tax revenue when uh, when people are laid off that impacts our personal income tax uh, revenue projections. And so we were facing a many multi-billion dollar budget deficit as a result of the shutdown. Um, but yesterday's uh, bill that was signed, passed and signed in, in Washington, um, is going to provide New York with New York state government with $12.5 billion in uh, COVID relief. Uh, and I know this makes Steve Newhouse happy. The county, I think, is getting $75 million from that stimulus bill in relief. Every local government, town, village, city is getting relief. Uh, and so, you know, this is going to be a real shot in the arm. Uh, it will prevent layoffs um, and, quite frankly, will bolster, you know, our services at a time when I think we, we need them most. You know, and I mentioned Steve Newhouse. I, I do want to um, acknowledge him and, and thank him. You know, I know he's been really on the forefront of uh, the, you know, the vaccine administration here in Orange County, which has been very challenging at times, to say the least. 
uh, in, in part because of state government uh, shortcomings. And uh, although this is getting a lot better recently, um, in part because of the federal supply that in the early days was really struggling. But he's done, uh, he's done a real fantastic job uh, over these past few months getting shots into arms. And, you know, I've been working with him uh, on the state level to try and get him what he needs with Senator Martucci. Um, and so, you know, while we're getting people healthy, uh, which continues to remain, you know, paramount, uh, you know, you can't reopen if people are continue to be scared to go into restaurants and shops. A lot of this is driven by human nature. Uh, we need to get people safe and comfortable and vaccinated so that, you know, you can have a restaurant open at 100% capacity, but if half of people still aren't comfortable going inside a restaurant, that's not going to do the restaurant any good. So yes, public health uh, um, requires us to get vaccines out, but also our economy and rebuilding requires us to get people healthy and safe and comfortable. And so we need to continue doing that. But, you know, in, in this budget, look, you know, uh, I think that, you know, we have an opportunity to, uh, to, to really, you know, create jobs. Uh, the, probably the simplest way to do that is capital projects, whether that's infrastructure, whether that's environmental projects. We're negotiating right now um, what the next DOT capital plan is going to look like. Uh, the governor in January, before we got this help from Washington, proposed a one-year capital plan. Um, it's my hope that we can uh, put in place, implement a five-year capital plan now that we have this assistance from Washington. And here in Orange County, you know, there's no bigger project for a DOT capital plan than the expansion of Route 17. Uh, the environmental work is ongoing now. Uh, we got $5 million a, a few years ago, Aileen Gunther and I, John Bonasek, uh, to do that environmental work. It will conclude um, this environmental study in October of this year. And let's get money for construction to put shovels in the ground once that environmental work is done. That will be hundreds and hundreds, many hundreds of jobs um, over the course of uh, a multi-year uh, project. Um, but there are lots of other uh, projects as well, environmental work that could be done uh, here in the Hudson Valley that will put people to work, whether it's replacing uh, the lead pipes uh, in the city of Newburgh. Yes, that's a health uh, issue, but it also puts a lot of people to work digging up uh, those roads and, uh, and replacing uh, those pipes. Um, you know, Resorts World was a project that I was very uh, involved in. I negotiated that license um, a couple of years ago in 2019 to bring uh, a you know, is a gaming facility to Orange County, and we're seeing you know the um, you know the, the work uh, bear fruit. Uh, they'll be opening. Um, their intention is to open in December. Uh, that's a couple of hundred permanent uh, union good-paying jobs in addition to the construction jobs that'll be part of the 32 million dollars or so renovation of a dying mall. It'll inject some life into that Newburgh Mall. And so you know, this budget for me is is about uh, protecting jobs. Uh, creating jobs, getting people back to work, continuing the middle class tax cut uh, that has been in place uh, and has continued to phase in. In January, the governor proposed uh, ending the phase in of the middle class tax cuts for people who uh, make less than a few hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, we, we ought to be continuing uh, that. And I believe our Senate budget that we will reveal next week will do just that. Um, and so I know there are going to be a lot of questions. I want to save time. Uh, usually there's very little time at these um, legislative breakfasts for questions because we all talk way too much. Um, and so I want to leave time for that. But I've been working with Senator Martucci uh, on a number of issues in this budget. We're fighting to protect the Goshen uh, Secure Facility here in Orange County. Um, that's hundreds of jobs, uh, union jobs. Uh, the governor's proposed to close the facility. Um, in the beds that are there uh, that help our troubled youth uh, here in this area. Likewise, he's looking to close Rockland uh, Children's Psychiatric uh, Center. That's, you know, all these facilities are hundreds of jobs or neighbors and at a time when uh, people, you know, are already struggling from this past year. Um, I think that's about maybe the dumbest thing that we could be doing is, you know, closing these facilities and laying more people off. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the fight. I'm still here. I represent the eastern half of Orange County, a little bit more than half of the people uh, here in, in the county. And so I'm really privileged to do that. And as always, I'm delighted to be here joining you today. Thank you so much, Senator Rascofas. We will have you back in a little while for some Q&A after we hear from Senator Martucci. 
Mike Martucci grew up in Westtown, New York. He is a lifelong resident of Orange County. Mike is a dedicated family man who believes in giving back to his community through volunteerism, teaching, and philanthropy. He is a successful small business owner who has created hundreds of local jobs, helping to grow our local economy. A part-time farmer, Mike cares about the environment and preserving open space for future generations. Mike enjoys volunteering for his church and is a supporter of the Community Foundation of Orange and Sullivan County. Mike is a member of the Board of Directors and Treasurer for SUNY Orange Foundation, which provides scholarships for individuals seeking to attain a college education. In 2020, Mike was elected to his first term, representing the 42nd Senate District, which is comprised of all of Sullivan County and parts of Delaware, Orange, and Ulster Counties. He was named the ranking member of the State Senate Committees on Disabilities and Commerce, Economic Development, and Small Business. Mike and his wife, Erin, and their children live in New Hampton, and their family farm is in Westtown. Welcome, Senator Mike Martucci. Thank you, Heather, so much for having me. It's certainly my pleasure to be here. And uh, hello to all of uh, all the members of the Orange County Chamber of Commerce. It's great to start our day with you. Uh, you know, so so first again, like I said, my pleasure to be here, and uh, my pleasure to, to follow Senator Scoofus. I would tell you that uh, I, I want to start uh, by also thanking him for, frankly, uh, becoming such a great friend, especially in the last couple of months. As I've uh, you know just started here, I am about seventy days in office. And uh, you know the way things work here is, is pretty unique. You, you kind of come in January 1st, and the very first thing you work on is the biggest project, which is the budget. So um, I have to thank Senator Scoofus for being so helpful to me in terms of helping my team and I come off the ground so quickly. So as Heather said, uh, i have um, brand new to public office. I've never run for public office or been elected to public office ever before in my life. I did grow up in Orange County, and uh, since this is my first legislative breakfast, I think I'll start a little bit with, uh, you know, kind of who I am and what I've done uh, so so far in my professional career, and then I'd certainly I'll touch on and expand on a few of the things that Senator Scoopus was talking about. So as Heather said, I grew up in Orange County on a farm that was uh, owned by my grandfather in Westtown. It's a farm that I'm so blessed to uh, to still have today, and I do a little bit of hobby farming there. I, I would admit that I'm not the greatest farmer in the world, but I certainly enjoy it and have a lot of fun. I uh, have a have a wonderful family. I have, I have the perfect wife, who's uh, perfect in everything except her judgment on men, uh, because uh, she picked me. But uh, my wife Erin and I have uh, three kids, all uh, under five and under. So my son Michael Jr. is five years old. My daughter Elizabeth is four, and my daughter Catherine is one. So Pretty crazy at home, uh, but uh, certainly a, a whole lot of fun. I'm a graduate of SUNY Orange, uh, which is where I started uh, my college career and didn't end up going too far. I went to Marist College, where I graduated in 2008. I have an MBA from Marist, and for those of you that remember, graduating in 2008 was a lot like graduating college today. Not a whole lot of job opportunities, so um, I was uh, looking back pretty blessed to have had the opportunity to do something that at the time seemed pretty crazy. I went out and bought uh, one yellow school bus and began driving it on a public transportation contract right in Orange County. And uh, just as soon as I saved up enough money to buy a second school bus, I did that. And uh, my grandma, who was retired, was my very first employee. And I always say she, she really wasn't an employee because I didn't pay her anything. I couldn't afford to, but she was really more of a volunteer. But in the 10 years to follow, I was tremendously blessed. I'm um, having been surrounded with some of the best managers and the best folks that I could uh, that I could ever have asked for to grow the bus company from that very first school bus to a company of just shy of 600 employees that were all uh, pretty much um, based in Orange County. We provided some service in Sullivan and some in Ulster as well. Uh, so um, we had uh, operated uh, school buses transporting um, over 10,000 school kids to and from school in the region each day. In two, 2018, I had the opportunity to sell the company, which I did. And uh, I ran for public office for a whole lot of reasons, but uh, you know, one of them was certainly it's something that I had always wanted to do in my life. I never imagined I would be doing it uh, now. But uh, you know, look, the reason I'm here is because I share a lot of the same concerns all of you do. Um, you know, I was someone who's been in your shoes. I ran a business in this county. I understand firsthand what it's like to struggle with so many of the issues that all of you struggle with every single day. And as Senator Scoop has said, you know, doing business was hard before, and the pandemic has only magnified all those challenges. 
So certainly when I had announced, which uh, feels like forever ago, a lifetime ago in January of uh, 2020, uh, the pandemic was uh, the farthest things from any of our minds. I don't think any of us heard of, of COVID. But, you know, certainly in the months to follow, it became very clear the things that, that we should be doing. And I'm also very blessed because having won the election, I have the opportunity to serve as the ranking member of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development and Small Business, which, you know, really is where I've spent my entire career. And I think as we look at our pathway forward, as Senator Scoop has pointed out, uh, you know, in difficult times, there's opportunities. And what we're doing here today uh, at the Capitol and every day is looking for ways that we can use this budget, we can use um, tax policy to help our small businesses, because at the end of the day, our focus is pretty simple. You know, we're looking to make sure that we can get vaccines distributed uh, as quickly as possible so that we can safely reopen schools, we can safely reopen businesses, and we can get people back to work. Those are the things that we are absolutely laser focused on. As Heather said as well, I've had the opportunity to work with many of you in a, in a couple different capacities. Uh, certainly um, one, one of my uh, favorite places is SUNY Orange. So I was so blessed to serve as a board member of the SUNY Orange Foundation for many years, and, uh, as well as the treasurer and the chair elect. But uh, you know, as I was fortunate enough to win this chair, I had to resign the other, but um, I've always uh, enjoyed all the work we've done with SUNY Orange. And uh, certainly the college for me is such an important piece of our county, such an important piece of our workforce development. And I look forward to helping from my new position and continuing to help in that respect. As we look at some of the things that have happened just from January to today, uh, you know, I, I just want to start by calling out a couple of them. I, I know that Senator Scoop has spoke about some, but I think I'm going to highlight a, a few others. You know, certainly one of my huge priorities coming here and having been an employer is, uh, I have a, a tremendous understanding of the state unemployment system. And our state had asked businesses to shut down uh, in, in, in entirety in some cases, as well as reduce capacity in the interest of public health. And one of the big concerns that we heard again and again from business owners was about the importance of holding harmless our businesses from the state unemployment insurance SUI experience ratings that inevitably were going to be increasing. So one of the first things that we did here in January of this year, uh, and certainly uh, with the help of my partner, uh, Senator Scoofus, we worked to pass and codify in law the hold harmless that uh, will hold our businesses harmless of those COVID uh, experience claims through state unemployment insurance. So there was just one step in what I envisioned to be a whole series of steps to really help our businesses at a time they need them the most. As Senator Scoofus said, certainly infrastructure projects are on our radar screen, and now's the time. I mean, this budget has to be a jobs first budget. And one of the ways that we make it a jobs first budget is we look at infrastructure. Certainly um, all of the folks that have sat in this seat and other Hudson Valley representatives before me have been working for many years on the 17 forward 86 project. So while I'm new to the game, they've been outstanding in terms of catching me up and getting me up to speed on where we are. So I've joined that uh, really important chorus of voices to make sure that we keep track on the project. As Senator Scoop has said, he and uh, other representatives had secured $5 million for the environmentals. And really from our perspective, what we're laser focused on doing is making sure that this project is shovel ready by October of this year, um, as uh, has been committed to us by the uh, Department of Transportation, so that we can make sure that when infrastructure money becomes available, we'll be able to be on the list. And this has been a long time coming. You know, I joked that I, I, was, I wasn't even driving a car when we first talked about the importance of taking care of this project. So it's been going on a long time. And I certainly think that we have lots of reasons to believe we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, you know, the other piece, obviously, being a small business owner myself and, and serving on as a ranking member of the Commerce and Economic Development Committee is our main streets. And Senator Scoop has spoke about Main Street in Cornwall, which is just steps outside of his home. And I think that as we look at the recovery here in New York, one of my great concerns is we will not recognize any main street after this is all over because we see the impact that this has had on small businesses. So dead center in our focus and in our sights are very practical things that we can do to help not only preserve and protect the small businesses that have held on through this really difficult time, but as we move forward in the future, look for ways that we can attract new businesses. The, um, the uh, federal stimulus, I know that uh, Senator Scoop has touched on, I think you know, really covered it very comprehensively, um, but it's a game changer for us in a tremendous way. 
And uh, certainly that federal stimulus is going to be assistive in us addressing the state budget, which is due in just a couple of weeks, uh, but also provide some really important support to our local governments like the county, um, like Senator Scoop has said, who's, who's going to be receiving $75 million and each of our towns and municipalities. And this money is going to be so critical because it will be the stopgap in terms of the counties being able to hold the line on property taxes, our towns not having to make tough decisions in terms of laying folks off and making those other really tough decisions, especially at this time. Because again, we're holding fast the important fact that this needs to be a jobs first budget. And this is certainly not the time that we should be making drastic cuts across the board. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Appreciate that. So we're going to welcome back in Senator Scoopus, and we're going to take some questions that were submitted previously by those that registered uh, for both of you to answer. And I'll leave it to you to decide who would like to answer first. Um, so the first question is, uh, there was a question about the real estate deficit. Would either one of you like to address that first? Sure, I'll jump in. So the, the number that the governor's been touting as our deficit for many, many months now uh, has been $15 billion. Um, that is, I, I would argue, and I think the facts would argue that that is not a complete reflection of reality. I, you know, we took a number of steps over the past year um, that have brought that number down that did not require formal cuts, by the way. So for example, we had a hiring freeze um, in state government. And so, you know, actions like that have actually brought that 15 uh, billion number down to about seven or eight as what I would characterize as the, the true deficit. And so, as I mentioned before, and as Senator Mertucci um, alluded to, uh, the, the recent stimulus bill that was signed yesterday, uh, New York State's getting 12 and a half billion dollars uh, this year. And so uh, we actually, you know, come out in the black uh, if you uh, if you sort of layer that on top of what I would again consider the true deficit. So so that those are the, those are the real numbers as far as I'm concerned. Senator Martucci. Uh, so Heather, look, um, Senator Scoopus is 100 percent correct. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, very simply what our focus now is as we move through this budget process, which is, again, developing in the next several weeks, is just making sure the money gets into the right hand. That's really our big concern at the state level at this point, because certainly the governor's executive budget proposal, which he released back in January, include tremendous cuts across the board. And I think, you know, what we're advocating for together, especially for our region, is full restorations of these cuts, because now's not the time to be, to be pulling back on so many of these critical services. So uh, Senator Scoopus is 100 percent correct about uh, what we believe the real deficit is. And again, our focus is going to be to make sure that we restore the cuts that have been laid out in the executive budget proposal, because for so many years we've been asking folks to do more with less. And uh, with all that's going on this year, it's certainly not the time to come with significant cuts across the board. Thank you. Next question uh, is really a statement, but I'll give you both the opportunity to address it. Uh, it says, please continue to support the Children of Orange, continue to support the 200 plus programs we serve. Would either one of you like to make a statement on that? Uh, sh sure. So, I, I mean, I don't think you'll find any politician elected official who is you know, not going to uh, lend supportive statements to um, making sure services are there for our kids. Um, but look, you know, it, it goes without saying that students and, and children have been put through the ringer the past year. And, uh, you know, that has taken an educational toll on them, that has taken an emotional and a, a mental wellness toll on them. And we, we do need to make sure that the services are there uh, for them coming out of this pandemic. And I'll just note, so our, you know, our Senate, um, so the way the budget works very briefly, the governor comes out in January with his budget proposal. Then next week, you will see both the assembly come out and say, hey, this is you know, what we think the budget should be. And the Senate will say, this is what we think the budget will be. And we'll take up and pass those, they're called budget resolutions, one house resolutions. And then from there, we have the three pieces by which we negotiate a final budget from that is due on April 1st. So next week, the Senate will be taking up our version of the budget. And I think you are gonna see a, a far more significant investment in our children than what the governor proposed back in January. Um, something that I care very deeply about and have for years uh, as a matter of fairness, uh, but also certainly on, on the merits 
is that New York City gets a tremendous amount of pre-K money from state government. Um, this was part of a deal that was sort of cooked up back in, I think, 2014. Um, and the rest of the state does not get parity, does not get anywhere near what New York City gets in pre-K money. And so um, I am fighting with Senator Martucci and many others very hard to get parity, hundreds of millions of dollars of new pre-K money uh, outside of New York City because early childhood education is so important. And it's even more important now so that their parents can get back to work coming out of this pandemic. Right. So, you know, that's something to look out for next week as we take up our Senate budget. Thank you so much. I'm going to read this verbatim. This was submitted. Uh, these are all questions that were submitted previously. Uh, so I want to make sure that I have this completely accurate. 410 thousand New Yorkers are struggling with Alzheimer's disease and another 1 million provide unpaid care for them. 90% of New Yorkers who died of COVID-19 had an underlying chronic disease. Of these, Alzheimer's disease was the fourth most common. Will you support the preservation of $25 million in the budget for New York's Alzheimer's disease caregiver support initiative which for five years has been the largest investment in Alzheimer's caregiver services of any state in the nation. And will you also support the restoration of $1.37 million in public health funding that maintains New York's ability to provide community support, early diagnosis, and the quality care management for those with Alzheimer's that was cut last year? Senator Martucci, would you like to take that first? Sure. So, I mean, look, I think that um, I, I guess I'll kind of answer a little broader and then I'll, and then I'll bring it in. Uh, you know, certainly one of the things this pandemic has highlighted has been some very important healthcare equity issues. Uh, and it's also highlighted, uh, I think, the importance of so many of these programs that are designed to help keep people in their homes as long as possible. You know, you talk about um, folks like independent supports for living and others that provides really important services. And I think that, it, you know, in the past, I know Senator Skoufis has been, has been a champion for these issues and I look forward to joining him um, in, in advocating for these. You know, this year, if one thing has been called out, it's been in many cases, the dangers of um, nursing home environments, right? And I think that anything that we can be doing to help keep folks stay in their homes and help these folks uh, be able to be cared for either by their family members or home care workers, not only improves the quality of life, but frankly, it's safer. It's a whole lot safer right now. Uh, the other piece of this too is, uh, you know, these are these are folks that uh, need care and uh, providing them care is our responsibility. And in most cases, this is a far less expensive option than, than a long-term care option or a hospital option. So I think that one of the things that we're all doing here, uh, it, again, the pandemic has really highlighted the importance of looking at healthcare costs, looking at those long-term costs. So when we talk about things like the $25 million that's needed to provide uh, caregiver support so that they can take care of family members with Alzheimer's or, you know, money that's that's involved with public health funding. This certainly is not the time that we should be backing away from those initiatives. We need to be walking steadily toward those initiatives for, for a number of reasons. Again, one, they're in the best interest of public health. Two, they provide tremendous um, improvements in quality of life, uh, not only for caregivers, but also for folks uh, that are dealing with these conditions. Uh, and third and finally, long-term, it makes fiscal sense for this state to be doing it. So um, I would tell you that I look forward to joining a chorus of voices again that have been supporting these things that I think have only been magnified. Um, the importance has only been magnified by the pandemic. Thank you, Senator. Yes. There's not much more to add. I think Senator Martucci covered it well. I'm in complete agreement. Uh, my my wife actually worked for many years for the Alzheimer's Association, and so you know if if I didn't do the right thing there, I'd, I'd face. Um, repercussions at home uh, as well, but on the merits, it's certainly the right thing to do. And as Senator Mart Martucci noted, you know we need to be protecting and, quite frankly, enhancing all of these uh, health funding uh, initiatives that are in the state budget. Um, the the idea that the governor would, at this moment, uh, suggest there be cuts to to this and and other health programs, by the way, I think is uh, is you know just poor public policy and. and really short-sighted and so we're fighting to restore that money. Thank you. This kind of leads into the next question uh, and I'll let you decide who takes it first. Two important topics for our state right now are nursing homes and the investigation of sexual, sexual harassment allegations against Governor Cuomo. What are your comments on these topics? 
Sure. I'll, I, I'll will, I, will, I will defer to the senior senator from Orange County. <laughs> we can begin. Sure, I'm happy to. So, so look, eight days ago, I made the the call to to have the governor resign, um, and I don't, I didn't do that lightly, and I didn't do that with any happiness. Um, you know, the the sexual harassment allegations have uh, been um, consistent over the past number of weeks. In fact, another one just dropped last night that is, I, I would argue the most serious perhaps of any of the previous uh, five or six. Um, last night's allegation is not even um, just harassment, it's actually alleged abuse, sexual abuse. Um, and so, so I do believe that the governor has uh, lost the confidence of many people in this state. Uh, he's lost my confidence uh, in the ability to continue uh, in his office. And, and so I was one of the very first Democrats in the legislature um, to uh, to call for his resignation uh, some eight days ago, and uh, and you know it's compounded by the nursing home issue. And and look, you know, uh, we just found out a number of days ago that sort of the the lie was covered up with a lie, um, and you know it's um, it's it's really indicative of I think you know th this loss of trust um, that many, including myself in the legislature, have right now with with the governor's office. Thank you, Senator Scufa. Senator Martucci, would you like to weigh in? Yes, Heather. Um, so, so first, I'll start with Senator Scufa is right um, on on all accounts. And you know, look, I think that the pieces that I would add uh, first is that you know, right now, what Senator Scufa and I want to be focused on are the things that we're talking about. We need to be focused on crafting a budget that gets our schools open in a safe way that gets folks back to work, that reopens our businesses, that vaccinates our state. Those are the things that we should be dealing with here at the Capitol. But instead, there's a tremendous distraction. That's happening. And that distraction is taking away from our ability to do all those things well. Uh, please understand, we're laser focused on making sure that we get our jobs done. But again, I mean, you see in the news that there's very little oxygen in the room to fuel any conversation except what's happening across the street the governor's mansion. So, you know, the first thing I would say is it's a tremendous distraction. It doesn't serve the people of New York well right now. But the second thing I, I would try to say is this, you know, I think when you look in light of all of the um, compounded issues that we're facing here, uh, I ask something this simple. And sometimes my wife is so helpful in giving me some really good pers perspective on these things. You know, if there were a school principal or a school teacher who had a set of accusations lodged against them, like has been lodged against this governor, is that someone you'd want in front of a classroom teaching your kids? And the answer is probably not, right? So if that's the case, uh, the real question becomes, is that person fit to be the governor of the state of New York? And again, what my focus is about, and the reason I've called on the governor to resign is because we need to move ahead with the people's business. It's never been more critical than now. And this is a tremendous distraction to all that's going on. It's important that these claims are all fully investigated, which I'm confident they will be. Um, but in the immediate, our focus needs to be helping the folks who live here in the state of New York and the governor stepping aside will help us do that. Thank you for remaining. The next question, is there any fiscal planning planning in place for infrastructure? I think both of you addressed some of that in, in your remarks. Would you like to speak of it any further? I don't think there's too much more to say. I mean, other than to reinforce, you know, we're, we're right now negotiating a DOT capital plan and there's some conversation about how what the duration of that plan is. Traditionally, it is five years. Uh, last year, we did a one-year plan in light of the pandemic to you know, sort of be able to reassess now in 2021. Um, and so we're looking to see how long is the plan going to be, how much money is going to be in the plan, and what projects are going to be in the plan. Typically, we're talking tens of billions of dollars uh, per year that are in these DOT capital plans. And, you know, whether it's, you know, repaving of, you know, the the the, wor the worst roads in, in our respective districts, um, bridge work, Route 17. You know, I'm even trying to sort of sneak in a couple of um, items related to having. Right now, the city of Newburgh actually is tasked with maintaining the state roads within the city. Uh, state roads in towns and villages are maintained by DOT, but in cities, they're not. Um, and you know, I'm looking to see if we can have the state take over the maintenance and the cost of maintenance related to Route 32, for example, in the city of Newburgh, uh, which also needs to get repaved. When it gets repaved, instead of the city of Newburgh taxpayers paying millions of dollars to repave it, let's have DOT 
uh, in the state do that. So, you know, that's, uh, there's lots of discussion right now related to um, infrastructure work to answer the question. Thank you. Senator Martucci, would you like to weigh in at all? Um, I, I think Senator Scoop has really, really covered it all. I mean, that's really, again, what we look forward to is having a more, uh, you know, robust long-term capital plan. And certainly, you know, one of our big focuses is going to be the importance of maintaining some parity between, um, you know, what the focus will be for MTA and then certainly our primary upstate issues, which involve, um, which involve our roads. Okay. The next, the next question is with the mass exit from New York City, do you foresee job growth in the county? You want to take this first? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I, I think I think the, the answer is absolutely yes, right? I mean, I think we see this already. Um, you know, certainly uh, home sales, right? I mean, you you can't find a piece of uh, you can't find there's a no piece inventory. Of, <laughs> right, there's, there's not a piece of residential real estate. I was talking to a friend, in fact, uh, who's a real estate agent, who said if I had ten more of these houses or a hundred more of these houses, I would have sold every one last week. So, um, you know, look, in NYC. <laughs> you got it. I mean, so look, Senator Scoop has talked about this before, you know, out of some of some, some of these really bad things that have happened in the pandemic, there's opportunity and Orange County is geographically going to be ground zero for this opportunity. So uh, I think that, you know, certainly all, all of your members uh, hold high hope in terms of what it means for economic development and growth in our region. And, um, you know, really from our side, I think that as things shake out over the next several months, the vaccine distribution, um, begins to uh, to broaden, we're going to start seeing the effects of that. And certainly, you know, our focus is going to be to make sure that we can help that rebound be as robust and, and frankly, as quick as, as it possibly can. Yeah. So I think the key word that Senator Martucci mentioned is we have the opportunity for job growth here. It's not going to happen by magic. It's not going to happen you know, by itself automatically, we have the opportunity with what's going on uh, in and around New York City to uh, to take advantage of, of new job creation. And we've seen this before with New York City, when there's something really, really terrible that happens to the five boroughs, you see this kind of exodus. I saw it after 9-11, you know, for a couple of years, there was a significant population shift outside of New York City to places and communities like ours. Um, and so now you're seeing it now coming out of the pandemic where they were obviously hit very, very hard. Um, so we do have this opportunity. Um, I do need to, you know, reinforce, I think maybe the, there's another question coming up uh, that dovetails into this, um, that many of the people who are leaving New York City are white collar professionals. And we need to diversify the jobs that are available here in Orange County. Yes, uh, blue collar, uh, you know, warehouse distribution, retail jobs, they're very important. They're very important. But we have a diversification problem here in Orange County. And yeah. so I hope, yes, Albany needs to provide the tools to the local agencies, the local governments to be able to, you know, create these jobs, attract new businesses. But I really hope and encourage um, our economic development uh, players to to really think beyond you know sort of the big box distribution warehouses that seem to be not the exclusive focus but the near exclusive focus uh, you know at IDAs being given incentives uh, we need to be incentivizing some new types of industries because you know, the people who are looking to leave New York City are not working in warehouses. Thank you, Senator. You're absolutely correct. That does dovetail into the next question. Um, and it kind of brings a lot of the questions together, too, because we've discussed infrastructure, we've, we've discussed job growth. Um, but something that I've heard a lot is that we do not have a fabulous mass transit system. So while we're building these warehouses and we are providing these jobs within the county, there are people that want to work there but can't get there so the exact question and i'll read it is there have been many warehouses built in our county to bring new jobs are there any plans in place for a mass transit system for orange county residents to be able to get to these jobs yes yeah, so the, the county has a bus system um i think certainly and i think everyone including the county would acknowledge there's always room for improvement um but your your point is is very well taken as it relates to in particular people who live in the two major cities in Orange County, Middletown and City of Newburgh, where many of the residents there are just have transportation challenges. They don't own cars, whatever it might be, and so there needs to be uh, an increased focus on 
uh, more bus routes, more availability, more, quite frankly, uh, um, communication and uh, you know public service announcement type uh, messaging to the residents about the availability uh, of transportation. Um, and so, look, you know, BJ's and, and other uh, you know big projects are happening in the town of Newburgh, for example. You've got the Throats World Casino uh, gaming facility uh, coming uh, coming down the pike, and there needs to be a way for city of Newburgh residents to get to those jobs if they don't have cars. Uh, and you know, look, we're not going to be building. I think you know. Uh, rail all throughout. We're not, not going to be subways throughout Orange County like there exists in, in New York City. And so busing is really the, the obvious um, and most feasible way forward to increase public transit. So there, there's a state role to play here. Uh, and certainly, you know, we look forward to working with the county to, to do better. Senator Martiki. Yeah, and, and Senator Scoopis is, is right on the money there. I mean, you know, the, the piece that I would add certainly is, you know, we see today with the pandemic that public transit systems, including our state's largest in the city of New York, are struggling terribly because ridership is down significantly. Um, you know, so there are some immediate challenges, which I think we're all hopeful will uh, soon fade away as we as we march steadily through the recovery from COVID. Uh, but yeah, the focus needs to be our major cities for sure. Uh, there are definitely um, employment opportunities and other opportunities that are right around those city centers. And you know, the fact of the matter is right now, while Orange County does have a bus system, the bus routes are few and far between, and it's not easy for folks to use. I mean, you know, if you've ever tried to use one of these systems, uh, oftentimes what it means is it takes you hours to just travel a short distance uh, because the buses don't run very often. They have a lot of stops. So I think that certainly as we begin to recover, this is part of that opportunities conversation that the senator was talking about when we say, you know, what, what are these opportunities that we need to be looking at and harnessing? And certainly the opportunity for expanded public transit in the two major cities, uh, at the very least, uh, is something that will be part of that conversation. Thank you, Senator. Stay with you on this question. Um, what was the defining moment when you said, I want to run for elected office? <laughs> Oh, Kathers, it's always such a great question. Um, you know, I think that uh, I, I guess the really the defining moment was when my wife told me I was allowed to do it because you know that's always such an important piece to this. I right? want to meet your wife. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, look at uh, here's the thing. It's something that I you know it's always been a personal aspiration of mine. And again, you know, being someone who's lived my entire life in the region, I'm a father of, uh, of three small kids. I'm a business owner here. I employed almost 600 people. I saw firsthand the struggles of doing business here. Uh, and and how difficult it is. And frankly, you know, I, I was so blessed to be able to tell the story that I told. But what I always want is I want the ability for any person who has the ambition and who has, uh, you know, is willing to take a little bit of a risk to be able to do the things that I did. And unfortunately, my story is unique and it shouldn't be. So, you know, I look at the, the opportunity for me to sit in this seat um, as one where I can pay that forward to folks. And, you know, again, allow anybody who wants to start a business or be successful in the region or grow their family here to be able to do this. So for me, I would tell you it was a little bit of a, a logical progression at this point. And then I was able to finally uh, pull the pin out of the grenade, so to speak, when my wife told me I was allowed to. That's great. I, just, I would love to hear that answer from you. Yeah, sure. I, I don't know that I have a singular defining moment of when I made the decision. And I certainly took a different path into politics than than Mike did. Uh, and, you know, so look, coming out of college, I knew I wanted to do something in government, something in politics. I studied it, did, you know, a lot of sort of internships and had experiences in college. Um, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I mean, you can do a lot of things in politics, right? You can, you know, be a, a staffer uh, in a legislative office. You can work on campaigns. You can work at a think tank, do policy work. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different roles you can take on. Uh, within government and politics. And so when I moved back home, um, there was an opening on the town board in, in Woodbury. Uh, and you know, part time, I was commuting to the city for my full time job, which actually wasn't in politics at all. Um, but I viewed that as, you know, hey, if if I don't like it, then it's you know a couple meetings a month. It's no big skin off my back. And, you know, I won't run. I, and it was actually an appointment to fill a vacancy for a while. So, you know, I could actually see a few months later if this is something I liked and decide to run. Um, and I wound up really enjoying it and found it rewarding. And I felt, you know, not to be sappy, but like I was making a difference uh, in, in the community and in what I was doing. And so, you know, it was, I think, you know, sort of that experience, evolving experience where I said, well, you know, this is something that maybe I, I want to continue doing. And then I, you know, had the opportunity to, to run for assembly in 2012. And, and I guess the rest is history. Here we are. 
be the change. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, what advice do you have for small businesses? You want to take that, Senator Scoopus? Sure. Look, I, I think probably Senator Martucci is better equipped, given that he, for many years, ran a small business himself to answer this question. But um, but look, you know, my both of my parents were small business owners. My mom owned and ran a dance school, uh, ballet, tap, jazz, that sort of thing in Sugarloaf for many years. Uh, and my dad still owns and runs a, a Greek deli down in um, Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, I, I think the one word that, you know, was very that captured, uh, you know, them being able to be successful and, um, and you know, get through difficult times, like no doubt many of your members are uh, situated in right now in the pandemic, is really perseverance. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, uh, no matter, probably in any job, it's very easy to sort of get down on yourself when times are really tough and times have never been tougher for a lot of your members. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's just important to continue looking ahead, to persevere, uh, you know, keep your dreams alive, as bleak as sometimes they may may seem um, over the, the past year or so. And and certainly, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask for help. Um, you know, we, we don't work miracles in our Senate offices, but there are ways that we can help too, Senator Martucci and I, and so people should reach out to us. Um, but, you know, times are very, you know, difficult right now, and the past year has been very dark for a lot of businesses. But I guess my advice would be, you know, continue to persevere if you can. That's great advice. I'm going to reword the question slightly for Senator Martucci, since he was a small business owner. What don't you know as a small business owner that you wish you knew that you want to give advice to the small business owners now? Oh, gosh. So, look, uh, you know, I, I guess I'll – great question, and, I, and I'll take it from where Senator Scoop has left it off. I and mean, I'm sorry, I went off script, so you're no, totally – No, that's good. No, the off, off script is fun. <laughs> we like it. The uh, we, we are, life unscripted is our theme here, by the way, at the Capitol. Because every day when we open the newspaper, there's there's a new development in in the soap opera that we call life. But look, you know, small business owners are resilient by nature. It's who we are, right? I mean, we we are folks who are able to take anything thrown at us, uh, and uh, and you know, do your very best with it, and find a way to serpentine it adapt. So, um, you know, resilience is 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 in our core. It's part of our DNA. And, you know, I think that when I look back at being a small business owner, when people say, well, what's the connection to politics? You know, when I owned a small business, I can remember some of the really, really not only tough decisions, but tremendous responsibilities that you carry. And I'll give you just one example. You know, I, you know, I go to college, I get an MBA, I, I study, I study business. And you're not not until you're in business. Do you understand the importance of things like cash flow? You know, where my wife and I were taking out, you know, the checkbook and, and writing a check against our home equity line to make payroll, right? And until you've been in that spot, you don't understand it. And the reason that, that I did that and the reason that so many small business owners here have gone months and months without a paycheck is because you are focused and dedicated and loyal to the people that serve you. And it was never lost on me that hundreds and hundreds of families relied on me every week to put food on the table put Christmas under the tree to make sure they had health insurance so they could go to the doctor when they got sick and to make sure there was a roof over their head. And that was my responsibility. And I was accountable to all of my employees. So many people said to me, oh, you've been so lucky in your life. You've never had a boss. You know, you've always been the boss. You work for yourself and now you're in politics and, you know, you don't have to answer to anyone, even though some people think the governor's our boss. He's not. Um, you know, it's quite the opposite. You know, when you're a business owner, like so many of your members, you are accountable to each and every one of those people who walk in the door every day, um, dedicated to serving the cause of your business. Now, when you're in public office, you are accountable to each and every one of the people, the nearly 300,000 people that we each represent. So, you know, to me, those pieces have never been lost on me. And I think it's so important to keep those things in mind, because when times get tough, Again, resilience is part of our DNA. It's part of our makeup. And what's the reason that we do it? The reason we do it is because people are counting on us. I, I couldn't have said that better as a small business owner and as the leader of an organization more than once. Absolutely. It's, it's on your shoulders. Last question. And whichever one of you want to grab it, what inspires you? Well, look, I, and, you know, not to, again, sound sappy, but, you know, the, the, the awfulness of the past year, I think maybe the silver lining of it is that we've seen a lot of good from people, right? And to me, 
to, that has genuinely been inspiring, you know, where whether you're a healthcare worker who literally like you're putting your life on the line every day going to work uh, to take care of our neighbors and, you know, have witnessed tragedies on a daily ba daily basis in the hospital and health centers in nursing homes. Um, and I, look, you know, I, I was sick with COVID back in um, April of last year, um, you know, Obviously, I'm I'm well. You know, I I don't have any um, I don't have any long-standing sort of effects. But you know, I was quite sick for a couple of weeks, and like people were dropping food at my house, um, you know, without even like asking if we needed it. And it was just, it was, um, it was it really touched my soul to see whenever you know people were reaching out to take care of one another. Um, so I mean, in our darkest times, I think we we do see some of you know the the best of humans and human nature and our people and neighbors uh, here in our communities and states and look you know we had thousands of kids write um, letters you know handwritten letters thanking our healthcare workers that my office organized and you know just like the most heartfelt actions you know have have sort of revealed themselves over the past year so that that to me has been inspirational and i think has gotten a lot of people through this past year, you know, people like needed to see that to help them get through the days and weeks and months of this this horror show. Um, and so, you know, that that has been very touching to me to see. Thank you, Senator Scoopus. Senator Martucci. So that was the question that I wanted to go first on because <laughs> all, all all the right answers. But no, that's, that's fine. fine. <laughs> I, listen, I think I'll talk a little bit more specifically about about you know something that's that's really touched me in the last couple of months and. You know, so when you get elected, you come here and, uh, you, you know, you serve on committees, as we had discussed, and these committees are, are assigned by leadership. So uh, sometimes you get to request, but you really don't get to pick. And, um, you know, one of the places that I'm, I'm so blessed to serve is on the disabilities committee. And, you know, while I owned a school bus company and had an opportunity to work with special needs kids, uh, transporting hundreds of them to and from school every day. And um, Aaron and I have a nephew who's, who's, a, who's in special needs as well. Uh, you know, it, it's not really been an environment that, that I've spent a tremendous amount of time with. And over the past uh, month or month and a half, uh, all day, we do these Zooms. And I have met so many incredible members of the IDD community who, um, as the senator said, just have absolutely the biggest hearts. And these are people that attack every single day with a tremendous smile, uh, whose, whose determination is an absolute inspiration to me because, uh, you know, here at the Capitol, we're so blessed to have a messenger service that's largely staffed by members of the IDD community. And these are the happiest people in these build, this building. You know, and, and this building houses our governor and 63 senators and 150 assembly members. And so many of us walk around here with a long face for all the reasons we just talked about on the phone. But uh, you know, who are the happiest people in, in this building? It's members of our messenger service. And I think what they do is they send a really important message to us, which is that you know, we, we absolutely have to be so grateful for everything that we have uh, because they again are attacking what we would consider to be just you know normal everyday activities uh, but for them are tremendous challenges with a smile with grit and determination and when i look at those folks um and uh, and like i said the determination and the tremendous positive attitude that they approach their day with uh, it, it gives me a real shot in the arm to take on the day so it's it's always a nice walk to the office in the morning because you get to meet a handful of happy folks and um, I think it's certainly been one of my great honors just in the first, uh, again, basically month, a uh, month and a half, uh, really, that I've been interfacing on that committee to meet so many of these great people. So uh, there is there are signs of inspiration and signs of spring all around us, including the wonderful weather this afternoon that we all are waiting for. Yes, can you take those photos of it? Because I didn't get on my motorcycle. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senators. I really appreciate you joining us and providing such quality information for your constituents. Uh, your time is so valuable and we really truly appreciate you making it for us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Okay. And I want to say that today's production was brought to you by EC Media Group, LLC. So we thank Everett and his team. Thank you to our sponsors to our corporate partners, our board of directors, ambassadors, and our members for allowing us to continue to support and represent you. And to your dedication to the mission of the chamber, visit Orange NY to stay up to date with, with all of our events and keep an eye out for a survey that's coming out for small businesses. This is gonna be a great way for you to give feedback about who you are and what you would like to participate in with the chamber small business network. Thank you and have a great day.